I'm really glad we raised the seed round and sort of focused on hiring an early team before building. Cause I think like I could have spun something up, but I don't think it would have been like half as good as, as what we ended up building with a, with a whole team of people. And when you're talking about critical infrastructure, I think that sort of like reliability of product experience matters a ton. Welcome to First Block, a Notion series where founders and executives from the world's leading companies tell us what it was like to navigate the many firsts of their startup journey and what they learned from that experience. I am Akshay Kothari, Notion's co-founder and COO. Today, we're in San Francisco with our guest, Juliana Lamb, co-founder and CTO of Stitch. Stitch helps developers secure and scale their applications with authentication and fraud prevention. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, welcome to First Block. Uh, very excited for, for this chat. I want to start with the origin story. Uh, I'm curious if you can walk us through like the beginning. How did you come up with the idea of Stitch? So my co-founder and I met working together at Plaid. Uh, I was a software engineer there and he was a product manager. And primarily what we were working on uh, was basically fraud and authentication problems. Uh, so I worked on building out a fraud engine that was basically identifying and blocking credential stuffing and account takeover attacks. So what that looks like is random website gets hacked, usernames and passwords are stolen, people reuse the same password across many of their different online accounts. And so attackers take those stolen credentials and try and see if they can use them to get access to an account with some value. We ended up building out some authentication in-house, layering on things like SMS and email one-time passcodes uh, to help secure those accounts. Um, and when we went to do this, we kind of looked at the market for authentication vendors um, and we were looking for something that was really developer friendly and plug and play that we could drop into our product and implement some of these um, multi-factor authentication features. We didn't find that. And so we ended up building it in house. And so my co-founder Reed and I had become friends at Plaid and stayed in touch after I left. And we were basically catching up over coffee. Uh, this was December, 2019. And he was still working on some of this authentication stuff at Plaid. I was working on it at VGS and we were like, this is crazy. Like we're building off in-house at two separate companies now. Um, surely there's gotta be like some vendor that we're just missing that is sort of the like stripe for authentication, if you will. Something really developer friendly, API first, um, easy to integrate, but also flexible and customizable. We then basically spent the next six months kind of like looking for that vendor, talking to other people, um, and just heard over and over again that the pain that we'd gone through was a pretty common one and that there was definitely some demand for this more developer-friendly authentication product. Did you know at some point where this sort of, this was like more of a project that you wanted to actually start a company with? Yeah, so I think we were both like um, interested in maybe building a company, but weren't sort of like ready to go all in um, at the beginning. This is like beginning of 2020, COVID is happening, lots of uncertainty in the world. Um, but I think what COVID did afford us was a lot of sort of time just like sitting at home on weekends. And a lot of people we knew were also just sitting at home. And so we were able to do so many of these like customer discovery calls. And I think that just sort of built into like this gradual momentum of um, getting to the point where we were like, okay, this seems like something that is really worth solving. Can you talk a little bit about your own transition, like from being, uh, you know, I, I saw you, you did like engineering internships, you also like a product manager at VGS, and then you became a founder. I mean, talk a little bit about just like, how do you, how was the transition from like being an individual contributor at another company to starting your own? The initial transition was not that challenging because it's like the CTO and co-founder, your initial job is engineering and product as an IC, right? I think I definitely, uh, felt like the, the pain of giving up some of the like IC engineering work as, as the team started to scale. And, um, I'd want to like be helpful and keep contributing. But then there's a certain point where I think I was managing like six people and still trying to like code and, um, be like a full time engineer essentially. And I was like, okay, I'm like blocking people now because they need my code reviews and I have like, all these other things I'm doing, I'm still trying to hire, I'm trying to like fundraise, like there's there's a bunch of other things um, top of mind. And so um, I think that was like a painful transition kind of going from like still doing 
uh, boots on the ground work to like fully stepping back and just being like manager type. I do want to chat maybe a little bit about maybe your early days of product market fit, right? So, so you and Reed start this company, uh, you start building it. Can you walk us through just like the early days, the early customers when you had like maybe a early version of the product? Pretty quickly after we raised our seed round, uh, we sort of focused on hiring an initial team and, and got that team in place uh, within a couple months. So primarily engineers and then an initial designer. Um, and it, we spent that time also identifying kind of like what the call it like six to 12 month roadmap could look like. From sort of day one, we also prioritized building like a self-serve experience so that you could log into our dashboard, get your API keys and try out the product without having to talk to anyone. And so sort of the initial beta product launch was basically email magic links and the self-serve dashboard experience. Um, I think we did that about like four months after sort of the first engineer joined the company. Uh, I think we, we definitely were slow in terms of like, we wanted to build things right to a degree. Knowing we're building critical infrastructure, we wanted to invest in some of that early on. And so um, we were sort of intentional about taking things like a little bit slow with that first product and, and getting it really right because we had conviction that we were going to build um, a lot more authentication products. And so we wanted to think about, okay, how do we like make this so that it's much easier to build the next one after this? Um, and basically the first customers came after we launched that self-serve beta product, they signed up, um, I think mostly from like word of mouth, sharing stuff on Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. They found us, they signed up, uh, they integrated, they went live and a lot of them we never even talked to until after they'd gone live. And we were like, oh wow, this person just like launched with us and, and we're seeing all of their like users log in and this traffic and that's amazing, who are they? <laughs> um, so I think that was like a really interesting sort of um, experience of like putting something out in the world and seeing that people wanted it uh, and not even knowing like who they are. Now that's pretty rare, right? To actually like launch your first product and it just sort of connecting with, were there like in those four months, which seems like a sort of a fast cycle to launch like a version one out, was there anything you all did to tweak to feel like that would land better as the first version, first public version? We just kept talking to developers uh, to really understand their pain points and help like continue to build conviction and what the like next six months of roadmap were going to look like. Um, as soon as we had something to like play around with, we would um, get sort of like friends who were engineers on a Zoom call and. Um, a bunch of us, me, a couple of the engineers, we would sit on the Zoom call and like watch them integrate the product mm. um, and sort of see the pain points they ran into, what were the um, errors they ran into, how could we like write better error messages, um, what needed to be explained in documentation. So we spent a bunch of time kind of just like really understanding those initial pain points and making sure that when we did launch, it was something that um, definitely, we've come very far from the integration experience that, that existed then, but um, that the basic sort of bare bones uh, material was there to get integrated. You talked a little bit about your seed funding. It sounds like you sort of almost raised that and then started to build it. Can you talk to me a little bit about that process? I'm really glad we raised the seed round and sort of focused on hiring an early team before building, because I think like, I could have spun something up, but I don't think it would have been like half as good as, as what we ended up building with a, with a whole team of people. And when you're talking about critical infrastructure, I think that sort of like reliability of product experience matters a ton. Um, so basically what ended up happening is we quit our jobs and almost instantly raised our seed round. I think we were fortunate to have um, support from like co-founders from companies we'd worked at and um, like people we'd worked with at Plaid and, and whatnot, and they introduced us to VCs pretty quickly. And so we ended up raising the seed round, um, yeah, in June of, of 2020, uh, hiring our first few engineers uh, sort of over the summer and basically had like a team of four engineers in place by early September. So that's when the building really started. So 
I've never actually like fundraised in person. So maybe one day I'll, I'll see what that experience is like. I've, I've done it pretty much all over Zoom at this point. It just seems actually more friendly to entrepreneurs. <laughs> totally. So we could do, you know, like eight to 10 pitches in a day because we just needed to like click from one Zoom to another. Um, I think the, there was like a, a very concentrated week and then like a little bit on either side of that that was basically our, our fundraise. And I think for that week, we were basically doing, yeah, back-to-back -back Zooms from like nine to five every single day. Um, and you're pitching and you have to be like really on and like ready to answer investor questions, et cetera. I think that week is like one of the most exhausting <laughs> weeks of my life. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about sort of you know your relationship with your co-founder Reed and um, how you all like split responsibilities in the early days and like how that's evolved over time. When he joined, he was on the go-to-market team. I was on engineering. Um, we probably wouldn't have like normally worked together very much, right? But being in a small office, I think Plaid was about 70, 80 people at this point. Uh, we got to know each other uh, throughout. Um, sort of, yeah, mostly those like lunches and dinners at the office. Uh, towards the tail end of my time at Plaid, um, we ended up doing some hackathon projects together. And basically the way it would go is uh, he would be talking to customers all day. And so he had a bunch of product ideas. Um, he ended up moving into a PM role shortly thereafter. But um, for these hackathons, he'd like come to me and be like, oh, I have like this feature request that or this new product that could be really cool. Um, like these big customers are, are asking for it. And I was like, great, I'll build it. And I think that really is like kind of a snapshot of what our like co-founder relationship has ended up being. Obviously it's evolved a bunch and, and gotten way deeper than, than just doing a hackathon project. But that's sort of how we split responsibilities uh, from the beginning. So I started out overseeing basically engineering, uh, product design and developer success. Um, he has been overseeing uh, everything, sort of revenue, uh, go-to-market, ops, all of those um, orgs. And I think the one thing that we like really come together on is product. Uh, we both have been PMs, and I think that's like one of the big reasons we started the company is we were really excited about the product we were going to build. Uh, so we spend a lot of time in like our one-on-ones on a daily basis, talking about key product decisions, etc. We've basically been splitting the marketing org, which has been really interesting um, to yeah be in the weeds a little bit more. And I've been focusing on content and he's been doing basically everything else. Uh, and so that's been a new sort of way of working where we're kind of like co-leading a, a team together. Uh, I think historically we've been much more sort of like separate in, in the orgs that we run. Can you talk a little bit more about that experience? Because I feel like sometimes like jointly running a function, you know, sort of actually almost like gives you more respect for the other person <laughs> what they do. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I think we talk about this often where it feels like we're maybe in sync on like 90 to 95% of the things that we're doing, um, which I think is like a blessing and a curse, honestly. In the earlier days, we had to like learn really intentionally how to like explain our like decisions, our strategy, et cetera, to people because we found that we often didn't have to like convince the other person of anything. And so you don't really go through the like um, exercise of explaining your reasoning. Neither of us had ever basically even worked with a marketing org before. And I think it's it's proven to be pretty effective that we are like pretty interchangeable in, in a lot of the decisions and I think are pretty good at like bringing the other one into a conversation when it does make sense, but also just sort of like acting with conviction um, when we're we're pretty sure that we'll be aligned. It sounds like just hearing you say that, it sounds like you and Reed have such amazing chemistry. And I think like for early stage companies, like that's such a treasure to have that amount of trust in each other. Um, so I'm very, ha very happy to hear that. So we're gonna switch more to a little bit and just talk a little bit about engineering product design team. Like, especially like the first engineer, how, how was that process and like, how did you sort of find this person? Since we'd raised the seed round, we kind of knew that we wanted to hire uh, like a small initial team. Uh, we ended up hiring basically four engineers right out of the gate, a front end engineer, um, a back end engineer, a more sort of full stack one, and then a platform infra engineer. Um, I have 
basically no front end experience and basically no infra at the time. And so um, I was like, it's really important that we get like very good um, front end and infra people because those are just like skill sets that, that I, I don't really have. So figuring out how we were gonna test for that sort of front end engineering skill set was probably the hardest part of hiring those initial engineers. Um, we ended up doing was basically a take home exercise so that I could review code, um, sort of, and the, the actual finished product of, of what they built, uh, with plenty of time and be able to kind of like really dig in and, and understand, um, the quality there. And so, yeah, I think we, we spent basically like two months just hiring, um, which was like pretty crazy. I think I definitely felt some stress, uh, during that time, just thinking about like, okay, we just raised this round. We're like supposed to be building a product and selling a product and all I'm doing is interviewing people. Uh, but I think that was like such a worthwhile investment and um, yeah, super fortunate to have most of those people still working with us today. Uh, a lot of them just hit three years, uh, which is, is super cool. Can you talk a little bit about just like where are these like folks you sourced on LinkedIn? Like they came from your networks, they came from investors networks, like uh, it's always interesting to see, like, you know, where did the first five people, you know, come from? Yeah, it was a little bit of a mix. Um, so we basically hired four and then one other person like a month or two later. Um, so out of those five, um, two were like college friends, one my college friend, one of Reed's college friends. Um, one person, uh, we were the same year at Stanford, but I didn't know him then. But then I tried to recruit him when I was at Plaid. Um, and he hadn't been ready to, to switch jobs at that point. And so I reached out again um, when we were starting Stitch and sure enough, convinced him the second time to come work with me. Um, and then there were two that were just cold outreach uh, sourced on LinkedIn. Um, I think I, I probably sent in the thousands of, of emails. We had like barely a website. I think our careers page was built in Notion actually, um, but so little information about us. We hadn't announced our uh, seed round or anything. And so you're like sending cold emails to people. And there's like nothing <laughs> there about you. So I'm super grateful that a couple of people did sort of just like take a bet on us and um, join us despite not knowing too much about what we were doing. For a lot of entrepreneurs, like they probably don't have like a recruiting process in place. It sounds like you, like that was like the one thing that you, even before you hired your first person, you sort of like put in place. Is, is that something that you just saw at previous companies and you felt like that was the way you wanted to start? I think Plaid in particular just did engineering recruiting like exceptionally well. It is such a like repeatable thing that you're doing. And so having structure in place, I think also helps you like make decisions because um, you're having to make so many decisions every day about whether you move forward with a candidate and it's gonna be super pivotal to the success of the company. And so having um, some framework in place can help you make those uh, decisions really quickly. Yeah, it's super rare. I think like a lot of people like so sort of make mistakes and then they try to like get into process. It sounds like you sort of like got that from day one. Um, I, I saw like it's like half of the team is now engineering product design. I'm curious like at this point, like how involved are you in recruiting? At this point, I do just like a 30 minute piece of, of the final round. It's basically our like values interview. Um, I have been hiring for someone on DevRel that would report into me. So that's the only role I'm like really sort of like uh, driving right now as a hiring manager. And for that, I have been like in there sourcing, sending emails, sending LinkedIn messages. Um, we have a recruiting team now. And so partnering with a recruiter and, and she's doing a ton of it, but um, I'm still fairly involved, I think, in, in a lot of those processes. Uh, I think the people are, are so critical to the success of a company. And so I'd rather be like almost too involved in recruiting than, than step too far back from it. I think at a certain point, we'll hit a scale where it just doesn't make sense. Um, but for now, still pretty involved in, in the day to day. Um, I would say the overall kind of like structure and ethos of the interview loop hasn't changed too much. Um, we've refined, you know, what the technical questions are. Um, how we think about phone screen versus on-site questions, all of that has has evolved quite a bit. Um, and I think we have done this one piece of of our interview process uh, basically from day one, and we've carried um, we've carried this through throughout. It was inspired by um, benchmark letter seed round. And when they gave us the term sheet, 
all of the partners got on a Zoom call and went around and basically said why they were so excited to invest in us. And I mean, you're sitting there with like Bill Gurley telling you like why he's excited to invest and, and Chathan who, who joined our board. Um, and that was just like such a cool experience and it just makes you feel like so excited about potentially working with these people. And so what we do for candidates is when we give them an offer, we get everyone um, that was on the interview panel to surprise them on a Zoom call and go around and say why they're excited to have them on the team. And we continue to get really great feedback that it makes people feel just like really seen and that they are like specifically wanted for the team and that they'll have a spot on that team and, and sort of start to envision themselves as, as a member of the team. Oh, I love that. Such a human touch uh, to the process. I, I bet a lot of entrepreneurs are gonna steal that <laughs> idea and, and do it. I think you still do the values interview, right? Have you found good um, ways of doing that interview, of figuring out that this potential candidate is aligned to you know, what the company stands for? Yeah, so we basically talk about our culture as being the sum of all the people on the team. And so making sure that people are values aligned is how um, we ensure we're bringing people onto the team that are going to be additive to that culture in some way. Um, they don't need to fit our existing culture. In fact, we'd rather have them like stretch us and make us better in some ways and, and bring a new and unique perspective. Um, and so the way that we sort of codify this is with two hiring values. What we look for are people who are ambitious and empathetic. Um, so I'll have them walk me through a project and then I'll ask what the toughest decision they had to make uh, throughout that project was. And I think I, I really enjoy seeing people kind of like think and like really muse um, through sort of like what, what that tough decision was. Um, I ask another question around prioritization. Basically, if you had unlimited resources, what would you prioritize and why? And I think that can really show sort of that ambition of like, do you have like an idea of like what your team could achieve if you did have unlimited resources? And then the sort of closing question that I ask that is meant to, um, in a lot of ways, sort of understand like what, how a person defines their own success and how they think about um, sort of dealing with adversity. The explanation, I think, of like why, whatever that thing is, was such a challenge really shows like how sort of like gritty people are and, and whether they're willing to put in um, hard work, oftentimes like without sort of much like external pressure to do so. It's, I think the best answers tend to be things that like you personally just really want to get better at or achieve. Wow, that is so helpful because um, it's so clear and like it seems like you've thought through this like line of questioning. I love that. Uh, maybe a quick one on last one on this topic. Uh, is there a perfect number of interviews before which it sort of becomes incremental? Yeah. For engineers, I do really like two phone screens and then final round in terms of sort of like key like stages of the interview process. Um, we've gone back and forth on, on some roles and I think have kind of netted out that like a third more in depth coding interview and our phone screens are also coding interviews gets you the right information as long as they are the right sort of mix of, of different mm. skill sets that you're testing for. I think you recently mentioned that your team ships a lot and ships fast, uh, which is actually something that all startups aspire to do. Uh, I saw your average time to production is 13 minutes, which is incredible. Can you talk a little bit about just how you've built that culture? Yeah, we've invested um, a lot in developer experience for our engineers and in um, I think the right tooling and monitoring as well to make sure that people are able to um, really sort of quickly like test and validate code. And I think that ends up being um, a huge driver in, in terms of, of velocity. Uh, really fortunate that um, Danny, our initial platform engineer, um, was really obsessed with sort of like internal developer experience. Mm. And so a lot of the foundation um, that he built really early on, uh, I think is, is something that you probably don't normally invest in until much later stages. Um, for example, uh, he came to me like 
I think right before we did that sort of initial launch, it was like, I really want to implement Honeycomb and have distributed tracing. And we had no live traffic, right? Um, and we like implemented Honeycomb. And so we continue to use them to this day. And that just gives us a great observability into um, sort of our stack and, and applications as a whole. Um, so making it easy to kind of like understand issues or understand um, problems before they arise or, or debug them if you do see them. Um, another thing we built out pretty early on, I think we were probably like 10 engineers, maybe, maybe even a little bit less than that, um, was a remote developer environment. So people can have um, their code synced remotely with all of the stack up and running. Um, and that makes it just really easy to um, write code and test changes basically instantly with the whole stack uh, running. Um, the, the latest thing that we did just a, a few months ago we have continuous deploys for our API, which is our sort of um, largest and, and sort of core service that we have. And basically what that means is we have a merge queue. So as soon as you merge your PR, it goes into that queue uh, and gets automatically deployed to production. And to be able to do that automatic um, deploy, obviously there has to be a lot of really good testing infrastructure in place. And so that's something else that we've invested a lot in. Uh, to make sure that you can feel really confident that when you merge something, it can go all the way through to prod and, and it'll be okay. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, I think on that note, I'm curious, how do you all decide like what to work on? How do you think about like the planning cycles? Uh, and then how do you make sure that like, as the team grows, like everybody has clarity on what they're working on? It's evolved a ton over over the, the three years that we've been doing this now. Um, Initially, yeah, it was just like all of us jumping on like a daily stand up and figuring out what we were doing that week. Um, we had a little bit of like a, you know, horizon uh, in terms of, of where we were going, but um, no planning at all in, that, in those days. And basically the way that we kind of do uh, quarterly planning is we'll come up with um, company level uh, sort of objectives and metrics. Um, the objectives are meant to be sort of like the focus areas for the quarter. Um, and then the metrics are at this point pretty like consistent. Then um, individual teams will kind of come up with like a, a rough roadmap of, of what they're trying to get done in the quarter. From there, basically what we do is this exercise we call tiling, but we have everyone on there. We have the different teams uh, and then PMs or engineers. It's like the infra team, for example, will basically tile out week by week uh, what projects they're going to work on. So that's sort of for like the big projects, um, trying to understand if there are like inter-team dependencies, um, if we have enough capacity to get the things that we're thinking about done. Um, and that gives us just sort of like an overview of like roughly like who's going to be working on what for what time frame. Um, and then individual teams basically like fill in the gaps from there in terms of like smaller tickets or bug fixes or other things that they're um, picking up along the way. Going back to sort of one of the things you, you mentioned, sort of like how your own roles changed, right? I think you talked a little bit about uh, sort of now having head of product, head of engineering. I'm curious if you can walk me through your sort of like your role in the company, like I think from coding to now sort of like overseeing a lot of these folks. Uh, are you still coding? Like you're still in the trenches? Like how do you spend your time? I wish I was still coding. <laughs> it's, I miss like getting to solve a problem in a day um, and like see the result of, of that solution. Uh, I feel like the problems I work on now have such longer time horizons that sometimes it's like, oh, I just want to like ship a fix and yeah. like see the impact immediately. Um, so I think the sort of first major transition was basically going from like managing engineers and um, our first designer to hiring in one engineering manager and then one of our first engineers uh, became a manager. And so all of a sudden I went from yeah, being in the weeds, actually writing code and, and doing code reviews to um, managing managers. Uh, and I think that was like definitely the first sort of like inflection point in terms of, I think my day-to-day -day did change quite a bit. I had to also, I think, get better at this more like broadcast communication of, I'm no longer like talking to every single person um, every week, at least, if not more often about like what they're working on, what's coming next, et cetera. I'd say the next like interesting transition was when we hired PMs. 
Um, and so then instead of sort of doing that role myself, um, also asking the engineers to do a lot of that role uh, as well, we had people that were kind of like driving um, that strategy and, and figuring out what we were building and, and what that was gonna look like. Um, I think the sort of like next major transition was definitely going from like managing engineering managers and managing individual PMs to now we have a head of engineering and a head of product. Um, both of those people, uh, one, the head of engineering was our initial engineering manager hire and our head of product was one of our first PMs. And so both of them have been with us for a while. And so I developed really strong working relationships with them. And so by the time they were taking on the head of product and head of engineering roles. I just had like a ton of sort of confidence in mm -hmm. how they work and their ability to um, be, I think in a lot of ways, like an extension of, of both Reed and myself. Can you talk a little bit about, I think like there's a lot of founders who are start with a CTO sort of start of role, but then in many companies it changes. Like some people choose that they wanna stay more tech architect, uh, whereas some people move into, you know, like a more of a, sort of a managing of the people and they're comfortable with that. Um, do you have any advice for how like a CTO is just starting out should think about their evolution of the role? Probably the worst outcome is you're trying to straddle both worlds. Committing to one path, at least for me, has been really effective. I was fortunate to like be sort of self-aware enough maybe to know that like the more sort of like people leader route was was the route that I wanted to go. Uh, did you manage a lot of people before? So No. <laughs> but you knew that you were sort of naturally, like you were comfortable with that. Yeah, I think I had planned if I'd kept doing engineering to be on the engineering manager track. I think I've, I've always just really enjoyed working with people and um, sort of knew that that's, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I ended up trying out the product path and doing PM for a little bit because I wasn't, I wasn't like maybe a hundred percent certain that the engineering manager role was, um, exactly what I wanted to do mm. in part because I really enjoyed like talking to customers and understanding their pain points. Uh, I think that was a really informative experience though, because I think I realized that like PM is like not quite for me. I felt like I was either gonna start Stitch or go and be an engineering manager was essentially the like mm. choice that I was making. I'm curious, like maybe switching gears a little bit now, thinking about the go-to-market side from your lens, right? So you're building these products, you put it out there, a bunch of people are sort of signing up on, you know, self-serve, uh, using the product, shipping it. How has that partnership with go-to-market sort of evolved? Uh, from the very early days. We've always been fairly like customer obsessed in how we build uh, and especially when it comes to like developer experience, uh, how people are integrating, what all of that looks like. I think in the early days, we were maybe a little bit more sort of dogmatic about the individual products. Um, so having a stronger opinion about like which authentication methods we thought were gonna be um, the most important and really powerful. And so I think the sort of initial feature set we built kind of based on like our customer conversations, but also like our vision for like where authentication was going. Yeah. And I think what we learned is that we were like a little too ahead in terms of like where authentication was going and needed to build a little bit more for the present of like mm. where people are today. Because we had that customer obsession in terms of like the developer experience, I think that enabled us to like course correct pretty quickly because mm -hmm. it's it's a similar um, sort of ethos. It's it's a little bit different um, in terms of like sort of the the what we're building, not just like the how. Um, but I think now we we sort of have this like sort of careful balance of um, what customers want versus like where we think we're going and. Uh, are, are willing to like slightly change things on the roadmap too, where if a customer is like asking for something that we thought we were gonna build two quarters from now, right? Like pulling that into the current quarter um, for the right customer, especially if they're gonna be a good sort of like beta partner and like test out the feature. I think we've um, really seen value in sort of like building with a customer as we, we build those new features. The thing that you said around just like sales and product, um... Uh, and by product, I mean sort of product and engineering, having a really good partnership. 
uh, and really good chemistry. Is there anything you guys did specifically that helped get into that? I think the main thing that has been helpful there is just getting product and engineering on customer calls, um, mm -hmm. talking directly to the customer. And I don't think you need to do that forever, but to kind of build the muscle, uh, I think it can be really valuable. Um, our PMs will get on calls with customers and prospects uh, pretty often still today. And um, we have awesome solutions engineers that are really good at like translating the customer needs. But I think there is value in like having the PMs on the call, like interfacing with the customer and like really hearing firsthand um, what those pain points are. I think the other thing we find really effective is Gong. Uh, so that makes it really low effort for um, like engineers, design, et cetera, to listen directly to the customer and not have to be on the live call with them. And so we use that quite a bit. Um, we have like a library in Notion of like all of the sort of like key Gong calls that our solutions engineers will hand pick. Um, that they think are really interesting for the EPD teams to listen to. I love that because it reduces the barrier for someone to like actually see the customer voice. Actually, one other question I was thinking about is like, what's the interesting, like for you all, the customer is like the, or maybe the decision maker or owner is, uh, is a developer. How have you all, you know, sort of built that muscle in terms of, you know, what is the right thing? to say or do for, for this specific persona that you sell to? Um, on the sales side, we invested in solutions engineering really early on. And so um, we will get SEs on like really early calls with prospects. And I think we found that to be really important because um, I think what we found is that the AE um, needs to play uh, a more sort of like relationship oriented role in, in a lot of our deals. Authentication is a pretty high trust um, product to be buying. And yeah. so um, what we found is that the AEs that tend to be like really strong at kind of like relationship building, um, navigating an org, driving urgency, all of those key things aren't always the ones that are like super technical. Um, because I think if you are like too technical, sometimes it means that you're like too empathetic almost with like the the team that you're talking to and like that can make it hard to like kind of drive that urgency because you're just kind of like brainstorming ideas and like moving, not moving the, the ball forward essentially. So I think being really intentional about kind of like who we hire for AEs and then who we hire for SEs has been, has been really effective and not trying to get people that can do it all necessarily, but sort of looking for specialists. Um, I think on the marketing side, definitely continuing to sort of learn um, how to like scale our marketing efforts, really trying to balance kind of like that um, general brand awareness by just talking about the cool engineering things we're doing, building credibility, giving back, um, going to meetups and events and just like talking to people and, and sort of like um, building that very, very sort of like top of funnel brand awareness is one key pillar. And then I think the other pillar is kind of investing in like the much higher intent stuff, like high intent keyword searches with good sort of SEO content and all of that. Um, but even for that content, we tend to um, try and prioritize something that will be useful for engineers. And so even if we're like SEO optimizing a blog post, um, we're trying to write it in a way that is like actually useful and interesting and engaging. And I think in, in some cases that makes us go maybe a little bit slower on some of our marketing efforts, but I think having that really high bar for quality in the long run is is continuing to pay off. You might be in like a, in a sort of an envious uh, company in that like the things you do for engineering, recruiting brand actually could actually <laughs> lead to sales also. <laughs> totally. And we've seen that. We've seen people that were customers, one of our first customers we actually hired as an engineer. Um, and yeah, we've seen people we've interviewed then go and implement Stitch. And so, yeah, it's super cool to see sort of the synergy there. That's super cool. Community is really important to you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what open source means to Stitch and why it means so much? Yeah, we obviously use a ton of different open source projects uh, to build Stitch. I think it's a really important piece of, of software development. Um, and in some cases, those open source projects um, either don't quite meet our needs or there isn't the one that 
uh, we'd really want uh, to solve a problem that we're facing. And so we built some things internally uh, that we realized would be sort of broadly applicable and, and maybe valuable to others that were facing um, sort of similar issues. And so we've ended up open sourcing just one of those so far. I think it's been really awesome to see how excited people were and it makes sense. Like we suffered through this pain and, and built something to solve it. And um, we rely on so many other people doing that and open sourcing their work. And yeah. so whenever we can, uh, definitely want to sort of give back and, and open source stuff we're working on. That's lovely. Well, this has been an incredible chat. I maybe have a, maybe two closing questions. The first one, describe a day in the life of uh, Juliana Lamb. You know, how do you start your day? What rituals do you have? Yeah, so I've been like an athlete my whole life. I was a competitive figure skater growing up. Um, now I really enjoy running. And so getting a workout in at the beginning of my day is like really critical to, I think, setting myself up for success. Uh, for the rest of the day. I usually go into our office here in San Francisco. Uh, I really enjoy sort of like getting out of the house and like getting to, to see people in person, even if a lot of my day ends up being on Zoom calls, um, whether it be interviews or talking with some of our remote team, et cetera. Um, and then sort of depending on the day, we do uh, dinner in the office. So I'll often uh, stay for that and tend to, to head home if I can a little bit on the earlier side and then kind of like, you know, after like 7 or 8 p.m., like get back online and um, be able to have some space at the end of the day uh, after taking a little bit of a break to refresh my brain to um, do emails, review like docs or write or, or whatever it is that requires a little bit more um, focused time. So um, yeah, try and be kind of like intentional with, with splitting up the day, but also know that that's maybe an ideal day and, and oftentimes that that's not what it looks like. You're, you're traveling, you're, you're going to events. There's, there's a lot of random things that get thrown in. Okay, final question. If you were to write a book about what's gotten to you to this point in your career, what would you title it? I would call it Pacing for Success, Building Companies for the Long Run. It's clear I really like endurance sports and I do think that like, yeah, getting that workout in every day is, is enabling me to like be in this for the long run and, and not sort of like burn myself out um, too soon. And so I think in terms of like how we think about building the company to making sure that we're like making the right investments uh, to build something really enduring. Well, if you're right, I will totally buy it. And uh, this has been amazing. Thank you for making the time. Awesome. Thanks so much for a great conversation. First Block is brought to you by Notion for Startups. We at Notion care deeply about startups and founders, and we hope these stories inspire you to keep building. To learn more about how we are supporting startups, please visit notion.com startups.